speaker is uh, Rob Language with uh, La Montagne Geophysics. Um, Rob's uh, another guy I go back a long way at, at Queens, right? Yeah, wow. Uh, he got his BSc at Queens. He got an MSc at U of T. Uh, for 32 years, he's been doing UTIM surveys. That's what he told me yeah, this morning. It's a long, that's a long sentence for anybody. Uh, and he's worked for Cameco, Blackstone, and then most uh, recently uh, La Montagne. And uh, more or less, he's right-hand man. Rob, his talk is called "Then and Now." UTEM-3 and UTEM-5 comparison over the Hud Bay Lawler deposit. Yeah, that, that was Kaminko, not Kamiko, but oh, sorry. that's not. <laughs> <laughs> Kaminko doesn't exist anymore, does Kamiko? Oh, yeah. um, all right, so I'll just get started. So I called this, it's my play on now and then, but um, then and now, so we, I guess four or five years ago, we, we looked and we said, okay, they're, they're going to be putting a whole bunch of infrastructure in at Lawler, so we'd like to get some kind of a baseline for UTEM-3. UTEM-5 wasn't ready yet. So in 2011, we collected, um, January 2011, we did a UTEM-3 survey over Lawler, and then we went back in April of this year um, and we did the UTEM-5 survey. So in January 2011, there was no power line installed. The, we used a single component surface coil. We measured, not on all lines, but two components, the vertical and the inline components. And we used the, the test transmitter loop, loop five, which was designed to, to test the deeper extent of the deposit. And we also laid out a loop of our own, which we, or a, 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 a loop that was designed to couple with the entire deposit and we just called it 5L um, just for Lamontane. We collected 10 channel UTEM data at 30 hertz, 4 hertz and 2 hertz and we have a few modeling results to show. We went back this year so the site's nearly complete, the power line's installed although I'm not sure if it was actually running. Um, this time around we use a three component surface coil so we measure the vertical, the inline, and the transverse horizontal components. We worked on two lines and we did a small cross line as well. Um, 12 channel UTEM data, we collected it at one hertz and we did one line at 0.25 hertz. So at 0.25 hertz, the last sampling time is about just over two seconds out. Um, and the modeling, we show some, we'll show, I'll show some modeling results as well. Um, that's just a map. So the red loop was loop five. It has the discovery signature kind of sitting on the south, under the southwest side there. And then loop 5L is the in black. And you can see the other deposits in the town in the area. So the UTEM system, it's a large fixed loop time domain EM system. Um, we measure in the on time and the UTEM instruments are synchronized together at the beginning of a survey day, and then they operate remotely for the rest of the day. And it's been like that for the, the 32, I guess thir more than 32 years that I've been collecting data with it. Um, the UTEM transmitter passes, it's a low frequency current waveform. Um, it's digitally created, and so there's a digital waveform the waveform is produced digitally and then it's amplified in the transmitter. Um, and we drive that through a large loop antenna. The transmitted current is, it's a triangular waveform but it's pre-emphasized or pre-whitened and optimized for signal to noise and power efficiency. So if you look at it on a scope, it looks pretty much like a square wave. Um, but believe it or not, it's a triangular waveform. The, the sampling takes a little getting used to. Um, because we measure in the on time, the, the sampling window covers half of the cycle instead of uh, more typically a quarter of the cycle. And the channel numbering system is reversed. So the latest time channel 
in, in the UTEM-3 is channel 1, and channel 1 is one half of the half waveform. Channel 2 is half of that and so on, so they, they get smaller. If you have the frequency, channel 1 becomes channel 2, and channel 1 is twice as wide. You, you get used to it after a while. Um, for UTEM-5, it, it introduces another couple of channels, um, but it's roughly equivalent to the UTEM-3 sampling. There is also tapered sampling available. And uh, the, the newer, more precise um, UTEM-4-5 transmitters and the UTEM-5 receiver allow us to put it. We put another channel in later in time, which we call channel zero, and there are some timing channels involved as well that allow you to monitor the synchronization of the receiver and the transmitter. So with the system, we can actually transmit simultaneously from three different transmitters. They're all at, at different frequencies. Um, so you collect three component data from up to three transmitters at the same time. And this was the lowest frequency that we've actually done the survey at. It's roughly a quarter hertz. It's, I think it's 0.23. Um, that's the sampling. So the boxcar at the top with just, a, it looks pretty much like the UTEM-3 sampling. The tapered sampling, the peaks of the tapers are in the middle of what would have been the boxcars and they taper down to the middle of the adjacent channels. And you can see in the detail at the bottom that there are channel 13 and 14 are opposite in sign right at the transition in time. So if the transmitter and the receiver are synchronized well, 13 and 14 have roughly, well, have the same value but have opposite sign. The tapered sampling is useful. It, it, it allows for a lot better power line rejection. So it's, it's not just it works. Just uh, we we generate our we have our own um, modeling software. It's called MultiLoop and MultiLoop Two and MultiLoop X. They're described in the in the um, extended abstract. But from in MultiLoop Two, conductors are rectangular plates. They're made up of ribbons, and the current is linearly distributed across the width of the ribbon and you can actually skew the center of the ribbon. So you can, you can play around with it. There, you, you have a little bit more freedom, but they're rectangular and they're flat. And in multi-loop X, they're, it's a tri-mesh, so a mesh is fit over the surface, and it's a planar feature here, but it can be, you can use many, many different shapes. All right. Um, so we started in... 2011, we collected three lines of, of UTEM-3 data that would have been roughly equivalent to the UTEM and the UTEM-2. Um, UTEM was an eight channel, the eight-channel system that Eve used for his PhD back in the early 70s, and we've done some modeling, and it, it would have seen this deposit. Um, the, so the, the bottom line here is the latest time channel, channel 1, and the data is collected inside the loop and then outside the loop as well. And then the next four channels are in the middle, and then the remaining um, five channels are in the top, top uh, on the top axis. Um, you, well, I can clearly see a, an anomalous response. We then we then put out the the loop five L, and we. We were trying to couple with the whole deposit, and again, the response is there. Um, again, the, the bottom time, ch the bottom channel, or the single channel at the bottom, is the latest time channel. It's corrected with the calculated primary field. All of the other channels are corrected with, with the latest time channel. And uh, there's HZ, the vertical component, and there's a nice peak in the data. It's in-loop data, so, so a response for a fairly flat-lying conductor would be a peak. And the HX data shows a crossover that you would expect as well. And we also did a, 
a short, primarily because we'd already laid wire out over it and picked up the wire so it was tromped down. We did a short cross line, line 63 there, and that's shown in the upper right. Um, so this is, the, this is a detail on line 184 of the two components that we collected, um, just the last five time channels. And I sh probably should have blown it up, but the bottom axis is t minus 25 to plus 25, but there's still a little bit of response at the latest time. So we would, would if we'd been avail if we, if it had been an option, we would have gone to a lower frequency there. Uh, we did some modeling at the time with multi-loop two. So the field data is at the top and the model data is at the bottom. I've added HY data just for comparison with the UTEM-5. So the model that we have here, there, it's a large plate that represents the ore body, another large, larger plate underneath it that represents the alteration, and then a whole series of plates that we basically just took off the geological information that we had available. All of the plates here are 300 Siemens, uh, with the exception of the alteration plate, which is 50 Siemens. And we would consider that um, a kind of low ball on the conductance because we, we, the latest time channel, you can still see a response there, but we didn't have good geometry on available to us. So, so we figured everything in the picture, all of those plates are 300 Siemens, except for the, the one that represents the alteration, and we figured that was a, a, at the low end of the conductivity of the deposit. So we went back in April of this year, we collected some one hertz data, um, all three components. Um, we're now labeling it HZ, HL, and HT, so H inline and H transverse, um, and you can play around with those and point them in any direction that you choose. And we did the one line with 0.25 hertz on the upper right there. So that was, we only had one day left, so that represents about a day's work. It's a little bit of detail on that. So it's the, just the HZ and the HX here. Um, the, the lowest the lowest axis is still the latest time channel. It's channel zero now, and any character in that axis is a combination of um, errors in geometry, uh, magnetics, and also any conductor that has a response that's still hanging around till that time. If you look at the, there's still just a tiny little bit of response on channel one, um, channel zero, you can't really say, well, maybe you can on the HX. Um, so even, even out at two seconds, there's still a lingering response. Um, and it's, it's probably, I think it's full scale four on the, the middle axis there, or two to two. Uh, so, so we're looking at something that's like, you know, point, 0.01 or 0.02 percent um, of a response, and just to kind of try and convince you that we can see that, this is data from uh, the Sudbury area where there there is no response here, and it's the it's channel zero normalized data, and it's channel one, two, and three, so it's the three latest time channels, actually from the top. Well, it would be. The largest response is channel three, then two, then one. So you can see the response decaying away, and we're down on the left side, down to the point where we can see a difference between channels of 0 0.01, 0 0.02%, and it's in uh, picotesla per amp on the right-hand side. Looks a little, little larger. You can see some little glitches in the data. Those represent so the, the axis on the left is um, Z, 
Um, so it's the vertical component, the transverse, and then the inline. So the, the transverse and the vertical component, any noise that's correlated on those two is just a little tiny bit of coil roll. Um, we figured this is roughly about a second of arc um, motion in the coil and any motion in the inline and the vertical component, again, it would be between Z and, and L, and any correlated noise you see there is probably just a little tiny bit of settling of the, of the front end of the coil. We were in a bit of a hurry when we collected the data, and if you looked at the, the data from Lawler, you'd see the same thing as well. Um, we did a little bit of multi-loop X modeling this time around. So this is just the vertical component on the, the three lines, the, the cross lines just in there. Um, this is depth to top 600 meters. So that's the, the very top upper edge of the body and, or the Lawler deposit. We dropped it 200 meters at a time, so drop it 800 to 1,000 meters depth, 1,200, 1,400, and then finally 1,600. So this is just one component, but we figure we, we could probably still see it at a depth of about 1,500 meters. We did a little bit more modeling. We just took the, the this time it's the HZ again. We just took the loop and moved it a a kilometer off to the north, grid north, and a kilometer off to the grid south. And, oh, going the wrong way. So that's a kilometer to the grid north, uh, the one component again, and a kilometer to the grid south. And it's just all three of them. And then there are also the other two components as well. So if you look at the HX, you've got the the responses from that and the HY. So you would know something was there. These are these are just the, the latest five or six channels as well. And I think that's it. So we figure we probably could have seen it back in 73 or 4 with if Eve had done some of his PhD work over it. Um, we clearly could see it with UTEM 3 and UTEM 5. And we were only using a single transmitter loop here, so you'd, you'd also have the advantage of being able to put out more than one transmitter loop. So you'd get um, three component data from up to three different coupling angles at a fairly low frequency. So um, I think we could we could find Lawler at a at a considerably greater depth than than what what it sits at. And I had. That's, that's it for, oh, hang on a sec. Oh no. <laughs> At, so the, the only remaining slide is just a thank you. So I'll thank Hud Bay for the, um, I'll thank Hud Bay for the support. <laughs> and I was gonna show a video, but I think I'm locked up here, so. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Uh, questions in the house? Well, I have a question. All right. <laughs> I thought you might. Uh, I, I'm sure you guys have done uh, noise tests on your coils. Um, you know, maybe t two coils together and do cross-correlation noise tests, that sort of thing. Have you, have you got that sort of data, information? It's, it's been up at the PDAC for like... Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I don't have a plot of it here, but yeah. Okay. I, I couldn't find it on your website. Oh, okay. No, I can, I can get to that. Yeah. yeah. I'd be interested. Yeah. Anybody else? A question for Rob? Notice that you have that big um, alteration zone as part of the response. Yep. 
And the uh, ZDEM responded to current channeling, and I think was primarily responding to uh, caloric currents in the alteration zone as well. Um, in your modeling, can you uh, consider current channeling as well as uh, the vortex response? It um, probably in the multi loop two, it would work a little bit better, but uh, and I'm and I think. Our, we probably underestimated the size of that alteration zone. I, I didn't hear out Al, Al Bale's talk this morning, but I, he says in in his abstract that it's it's huge. So the size of it as well probably contributes quite a bit to the response. So um, so I, I'm not sure. I, I think I would probably try and model my response. Well, I, I didn't do it, but it, with a larger with a larger alteration zone, and see how much see how much I that's what I'm getting as opposed to the conductivity, the conductance, because the conductance I, I didn't say it, but we upped it by about a factor of ten, and we were a little surprised. It's like three or four thousand Siemens in the, the models we showed there. So, so when uh, when you shifted that loop uh, a kilometer to the north, do you think it was actually seeing lower, or do you think it was just seeing that alteration zone? Oh, it, it's the alteration zone there I have is fairly weak. It's a, you could take it out of the picture and it would still see the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a kilometer down, right? So or 600 meters down, but some of it's a kilometer down. So I don't actually think a kilometer off to the side was far and far enough to go, right? Yeah. Do we have to get this? Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.